clearly agitated um, and uncomfortable, and um, he wasn't eating. There, but there was nobody there, just Slim and me. I called his son because it didn't look good, and his son couldn't even come. So this is real disturbing, and I said a prayer at that moment. I said, God, I need you just to take away his fear and his pain so that he can go where you need him to go. And um, it was kind of amazing, really. Even a adult like me could see what happened. It took about two minutes, and he just calmed right back down, and we were able to have a nice visit um, as far as we could, you know, without his hearing aid. We were kind of still shouting back and forth. But he, he had deteriorated. He was very, very weak. And after our visit, he fell asleep, and about 40 minutes later, he died in my presence. At the time... I thought, well, this is pretty cool. At least I got to be with him. He wasn't alone. And it was all about Slim. And I'm embarrassed to admit to you that for the next five years, I kept thinking that until about three weeks ago when I started to prep for this. Um, now I know that the act of being called to be with a friend or with anybody actually as they die is an incredibly inclusive thing. And it's profoundly moving to be with somebody and love them on their way out in a very intimate moment. Um, I might just say that if you find yourself in a situation like that, don't pass it up because it's very, very good. And it kind of brings home the fact that death is not an end, it's just a transition. So, and I got to see a miracle at the same time. Um, fast forward to last year, uh, my father-in-law, was very ill. He had been suffering from Parkinson's for about 20, a little over 20 years, and he suddenly took a turn, which is the way Parkinson's goes. Um, and uh, I happen to be home. I travel a lot for my work, but I happen to be home this time. So were my wife and uh, his wife um, and my wife's sister and my sister-in-law. And we all got to be there with him. When I came in, it was very clear to me that he was not heading in a positive direction. It was just really obvious. There was a hospice nurse there who looked at vital signs and all the, you know, the medical parameters. And I said, well, how does this look? And, and the, the nurse said, well, you know, it could go weak. You just don't know. But I, who have no medical knowledge at all, just didn't feel like that could be right. And, and I should point out that my friend Slim and my father-in-law, Jim, were two very different people with different needs. And it was clear to us that Jim needed a clergyman there. And so I called Rick, who I believe it was the night before you were gonna to go to Mexico last year. I mean, you were hurrying to try to make it all happen. <coughs> he came, said the last rites, said a prayer with all of us. In fact, it was good for the whole family. Um, and then not three hours later, Jim died. So what's interesting about this for me is that I cannot tell you who was better off for this experience of inclusion. Was it Jim or Slim who got to have loved ones around and be loved on their way out? Or was it us who got to participate in the experience? And that's the really cool thing about inclusion. It flows, and like, like all gifts from God, really, it flows in a circular manner. So what I would like to leave you with is that I hope each of us can have open hearts to receive the inclusion that God pours out either to us or through us as we contemplate what Lent means this year. Amen. We're going to sing uh, hymn number 659 from your red hymn books. 659. Will you let me be your servant?
this time we worship God.